Hello, uh, this is Marjorie Tesser. We're here with Hetty Jones, the author of How I Became Hetty Jones, Drive, Doing 70, and many other works. And we're going to speak with her at her home this afternoon. Driving seemed to be kind of uh, symbolic of independence to you in a lot of your poems. Yeah. And um, was that actual or just symbolic for you? No, it was actual. Because, um, like any New York City girl in, in back in the 50s, you couldn't get a license until you were 18. But that was the mark of uh, a great independence. So I got a license, and then I was off in college, and I never drove again until I was 30, 30 years old. This summer I was 30, and I was out in uh, East Hampton, it, it was, and Larry Rivers, the painter who was a friend of ours, rented a car for me because I arrived with just the kids, although I was still married, but uh, he was off somewhere, and he plunked me in the driver's seat. He said, well, here's a car, mm. and, and I was terrified, but I grew to love it and drove drove home and that was it for me. But it, it was, I think, metaphorically. Uh, I liked the, the solitude of driving by myself and also I could get gigs out in Staten Island or out, I mm -hmm. taught at SUNY Purchase. Mm -hmm. Well, the independence, well, I've always been independent. Although I'm not an only child, I have an older sister, but mm -hmm. Um, I early on realized, looking at the life my mother had led and the life that my older sister had already embarked on, which was a reproduction of my mother's life, mm -hmm. I didn't want that and I didn't want to be forced into it. And so I decided to go to a woman's college. Hmm. And that was a big, that was a big departure because you were supposed to go to college to find a good man. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, I was really not that. I wasn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I established that mode early, early on, and then I, you know for a young woman to have her own apartment, and then for, to live in the village, uh, it, it, it was an embarrassment, I think, to my parents. This was in the 1950s, right? Yeah. yeah. So did you find that the women's college um, nurtured your independence? Oh, absolutely. You were in the South, right? That must Even, have been very different for a girl from Queens. <laughs> oh, it was. It was. In a, I was shocked. Uh -huh. and, uh, but it taught me a great lesson. I was out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I was the only Jew in my class. Mm -hmm. And to, to experience the South before Brown versus Board of Education was a very different thing. And to see everything about social justice that I had ever imagined violated there, mm. um, I think it set me on some kind of a path. But also, because it was a woman's college, I was allowed to shine in ways that I might not have been allowed to um, in, in an a large university setting, or if I had not gone away to school. Mm -hmm. um, and so I became the vice president of my class. I had a radio show. I, I, uh, I sang. Wow. <laughs> and played the piano. You know, things that um, I probably wouldn't have done. So. Yeah, I was I was on my I was on my own, and then as soon as I got out of college, I left I left home. I I never lived at home again. Mm -hmm. uh, 
except briefly while I was getting an apartment in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, given the fact that this was 1955, it was something that wasn't done. But I was on my, you know, I was on my way and I had that kind of determination. Mm -hmm. You know, and nothing was going to stop me. So, it, I suppose it's just part of, of, I don't know how I got that way. I probably was born that way. Yeah, there's something in your uh, memoir where you talk about being a little girl and having that feeling of not wanting yeah. what you were seeing around you and wanting no, something I different. Uh, I did not understand what art was, but I played the piano very early from the time I was four. Mm -hmm. And that was more satisfying than being in a family and being loved, although I was loved. But I didn't rely on that. Maybe I just took it for granted. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really understand the psychology of it. But you know, I have a little granddaughter now who is so much like me. We're, she was born for the stage. She has no fear of being on stage and holding the microphone in her hand. So hmm. I think some, I think sometimes, I guess that's what you expect of yourself in some way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I've just always been that way. It, that's my independence. And and then after, uh, after I was divorced, but I was always working. You know, when I was a young woman, even when I had kids, I was always working. So, and I had good, interesting work because I worked for the Partisan Review and I ran that office. And then I did freelance work for Grove Press and people, all the other publishers, and and they were all doing good books then. Uh, so even after I was divorced, I was, I was myself. I was always myself. Mm -hmm. I hadn't been subsumed, although societally, I will always be connected with, you know, with the beats and with everything else. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the former Leroy, that's how I refer to him. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that he said anything in his autobiography that, that I took exception to. Um, I just figured it was time I wrote my own book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed your book very much. And um, one of the things that I really agreed with you about is how women who were involved in the Beat era really were the precursors of women's lib, which came into fruition in the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. Um, by defying societal expectations and striking out on your own and uh, you know living the artist's life and all that. Um, I'm wondering whether uh, the 70s uh, people who were prominent in the women's liberation um, movement recognized that. Um, recognized you guys as uh, Four. Four mothers. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't. Uh -huh. They didn't. Later, after Joyce Johnson wrote her book, mm -hmm. and then after I wrote mine, they began to see, oh, there were others. Mm -hmm. Before, we just jumped up and said, we are, you know, <laughs> we are the world, <laughs> right. we are the children, right? Um, and I've met some of those women, um, and they, they, they really think they invented it, or they did think so. But, I, you know, um, as long as it's known that we were out there, but, you know, there, there have always been women who defied expectation. I don't think we were any kind of a new woman except that there hadn't been a bohemia for quite some time because of the Second World War, because right. of the Depression first, yeah. 
and the Second World War intervening, mm -hmm. and then the the uh, the older women that I knew when I was a young woman running the Partisan Review, women like the poet Barbara Guest, women like Mary McCarthy, they were independent, but they were also solidly connected to men. They married serially. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I found that they, they weren't as vocal about their independence. They simply were artists, but they were a, a protected species in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And um, th there were some women painters in the abstract expressionist movement um, who, whom I also admired. and. Right now I'm blanking on everybody's name. But they didn't get the kind of attention that they needed to get, e really, either. Um, and I wonder, after all, if you took a poll of how many people, how many guys read Mary McCarthy's book, The Group, or all, any of those other novels, how many of them did read them? Those were considered women's books, you mm -hmm. know. Considering, you know, you have to look, since it's, we're in a global world now, Global economy, global, oh, but we're very well off considering. Yeah. Considering that we're not forced to cover our eyes. Yes. Our noses or our heads. Right.